Have you ever had to endure a situation that you just didn't think that you'd be able to hang in there and get through? Kind of like the last 12 months, right? And yet sometimes we find strength that we didn't know that we had. Today, we are privileged to have one of our lay servants here at this church, uh, Sophia Vicari, is going to share a message for us about perseverance, particularly through the story of Ruth. This is the second week in a sermon series here about women in the Old Testament called Did You Know Bible Stories Too Often Overlooked? We're going to see how Ruth was able to persevere and to push through and what we can learn from Ruth and how putting our faith in a God who never fails us can help us to persevere even when we're ready to give up. But first, let's hang in there and bring our worries and our hopes to our good God. Let's join our hearts and worship together.
Welcome, good friends. It is so good to have you here in worship. We are continuing uh, to worship virtually and in person here at Haddonfield United Methodist Church, and uh, it's just such a joy to be able to be connected, whether in real time or if you're able to worship with us at your convenience anytime. I want to encourage you to let us know that you're here. If you're new, text the word new to the number on the screen. We would love to know that you're here and who you are. And if you, if this is your church or you've been worshiping with us for a while, let us know that you're here. 
by filling out a connect card. That link is also in the chat here in the worship. Um, and you can share any prayer requests or concerns or needs, pastoral needs that you might have. Share this service, if you don't mind, with friends after the fact to help us to share the good news of our loving God with, with many people. Today, as we join in worship, it's the first Sunday of the month. Normally, in person, we celebrate communion. And here, virtually, we've been sharing something called a love feast, which is a Methodist tradition dating back to the early days of the Methodist movement, when we would take simple elements. Today, I have crackers and uh, water. And we're going to remember Jesus' Last Supper with us. And so I want to encourage you uh, to grab something to eat and something to drink so that after the sermon, today you can join us in this love feast together as we remember Jesus' love and grace for each one of us. Today, May 2nd, Sunday, um, we are going to have a virtual concert of the New Jersey Master Chorale and our chancel choir uh, together. It is, is going to be at 7 o'clock tonight in uh, real time, live on Facebook Live, on YouTube, and on our website, HaddonfieldUMC.org. But the good news is, the moment that it's over, you can visit our YouTube channel, the address here on the screen, and you can find the concert anytime. You can share it with others. And as always, we invite you to get the word out with friends. The concert is going to uh, feature some virtual anthems, uh, in the theme of Hope of Spring, and also soloists, uh, Crystal Williams, Cody Austin, um, a piece by the Symphony and C from their Virtuosi series, and some other uh, special treats in this concert. So I encourage you to check it out tonight at 7 o'clock or any time after. And today, um, we encourage you as uh, an act of worship, if you would uh, share your generous support with us as you're able and as you are willing, um, it helps us to continue to be in ministry even when we can't see each other face to face. Uh, I just want to offer words of gratitude to all the people and the staff of this church who have been actively at work, being in ministry with little kids. We have Sunday school classes going on virtually today, being in ministry with our youth and with people of all ages. All of that ministry is possible because you and me, your family and mine and others are sharing their gifts to share the good news of Jesus Christ in this world. So you can do that through our church app, through our website, through uh, texting to give, again, the number on the screen, or you can send a check to the church. I'm grateful you're here, and let's continue to worship God together. Hi, everybody. I'm Ella. And I'm Grayson. And we're going to learn about the story of Naomi and Ruth and how church is our family. For today's experience, you will need one box of spaghetti, two sheets of styrofoam, and some heavy objects like books from around the, your house. Take 10 to 20 spaghetti noodles and stick them in your styrofoam so they are sticking straight up. Make sure they spread fairly evenly around. If the spaghetti noodle breaks, it's okay. You can always put a new one in. Okay, so now take a heavy book and place it on top. So you guys can go ahead, just one, just do one at a time. That. Nope. Try yours, Ella. Nope. Nope. Does the spaghetti hold up the weight of the book? No. What do you think we can do to hold up the weight? If you only have spaghetti to use, what could you do? We could put the put a each other and make it and put a lot and a lot 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 this time. Okay. When you have used up all or most of your box of noodles, place the other piece of foam on top. Now carefully try to place one book on top of the noodles. Rebalance it here. There we go. Okay, now try another book. Easy. Nice. Oh. Does the structure hold the weight up better like that? Yes. How many books was it able to hold this time? Um, five. 
five. Four. Four. Four, and then the fifth one fell, right? Yeah. So how many could the the spaghetti, like the twelve pieces of spaghetti, hold? How many could that hold? Zero. 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 It never did hold it, right? No. Never. Why do you think this works? Because because it because more it noodles. has more noodles. Yeah. And and it has more weight to um, ba balance on. That's right, it distributes the weight more evenly, right? On mm -hmm. many pieces of spaghetti, right? Mm -hmm. So it's too heavy for the noodles, so it broke or fell over. But then if you add more, they work together to carry the load, right? They're able to do more because each isn't holding too much weight. Yeah. In today's scripture, Naomi lost her husband and two sons. She tells her two daughters-in-law to go home to their families, but Ruth was determined to stay by Naomi's side by saying, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Those we can consider family may not always be related to us. As a church, we build relationships, and we are a family under God. Today's experiment shows us the power of working together, together as a family. We are stronger and we work together to share in each other's good times and bad times and help us spread God's message of love to others. Try this fun activity at home and see what results you get. Have fun and see you next week. Good morning. The word of the living God for today is Ruth, chapter 1, verses 6 through 18. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord may grant you, may find you security, each of you in your own house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb? that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they are grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Oprah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you, or turn, to turn back from you following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. And your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. From bedtime stories to history books, stories shape our identities and worldviews. Often, the stories we hear are told by the loudest voices, we need to dive deeper and learn the stories too often overlooked. After all, a book with missing pages has plot holes. Let us meet amazing women in the Bible, too often overlooked. Like their stories, your story is unique. Your story is a part of our story, and all stories are a part of God's story. When my grandfather was still alive, he loved food. I mean, honestly, he's probably eating God out of house and home at the moment. Mom told me that whenever he would come over, he would hover over her in the kitchen, excited for what she was cooking. 
Mom, with a small child, husband, and now father-in-law needing her attention, devised a genius solution. She would put a snack at the opposite end of the kitchen to ensure grandfather would give her some space. Yes, mom's plan worked. He would follow the food. And we have a framed photo of him in the kitchen to this day, the perfect tribute to the man who is probably still curious what mom is cooking. Grandfather kept his eye on the prize, snacks, and adapted to his changing environment to achieve his goals, eating the snacks. Speaking of someone who adapted to their changing environment, this week we're looking at the story of Ruth. The book of Ruth is only four chapters long, but as someone who is only 5'4", I can assure you good things come in small packages. You may be familiar with her story, but before Pastor g asked me to preach about her, I was not. In case you're like me, or if you need a refresher, allow me to give you a Sparknotes version of Ruth. Naomi and her husband, Elimelech, lived in Bethlehem. When there was a famine, Naomi, her husband, and their two sons moved to Moab. While in Moab, Elimelech passed away. Naomi's sons married Moabite women. Then Naomi's sons passed away. Not only was this a tragic loss of beloved family for Naomi and her daughters-in-law, but it was also a loss of security in a time when society deemed women essentially worthless without husbands. Naomi decided to return to Bethlehem, but she told her daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, to stay in Moab with their families and their religion. After all, Moab was where they were born and raised. Naomi knew that Orpah and Ruth were young enough to get married again and have a second lease on life. More so for the whole patriarchy thing, not for romance. Naomi also knew that she had essentially aged out of the marriage game and would have to figure out a way to live without one. After some protest, Orpah decided to go back to her family. However, Ruth refused to leave Naomi, so the two of them traveled to Bethlehem. This put Ruth in a new land with new people. Rather than break under the weight of juggling grief and a big move, Ruth got to work, literally. She decided to collect the grain harvesters left behind. In a Hallmark-esque twist of fate, or should I say divine intervention, she ended up working in the part of the field owned by Boaz. Now, Boaz was a redeemer or protector or caretaker of Elimelech's family. Ruth caught his eye, and he ensured she was protected in his field. When Ruth told this to Naomi, Naomi saw a way out of their sad situation. She had Ruth essentially go flirt with Boaz, and as Reverend Dr. Lynn Jappinga says, we'll get to her later, rather than wait for Boaz to ask for her to marry him, Ruth took initiative and reminded him of his role as protector of the family. Once Boaz ensured that the man who was technically next in line did not want to marry her, Boaz married Ruth, and thanks to God, they had a son. And that son continued a family line that includes David and Jesus' earthly dad, Joseph. We are learning about Ruth's story today because her story is an important part of history, and all stories are a vital part of God's story. On the surface, it looks like Ruth abandons everything, her childhood faith, her family, and her country. It's easy to just say that Ruth was so loyal and loving, and we should all strive to be as loyal and loving as she was. But merely scratching the surface does a disservice to all Ruth was, not to mention the sermon would end here. We must dive deeper into Ruth's story, because in only four chapters, she left us with a roadmap for success in uncertain times. You might be thinking, how could a story about a woman who gets married to save her family be relevant in a time when we're emphasizing faith and family and friendship over dependence on a romantic partner? I'll admit, when I first heard about Ruth's story, I thought, well, we have nothing in common. I literally have no experience caring for a mother-in-law. But let's examine how Ruth's story can guide us through these unfamiliar times, as I would venture to guess, we've all had to be a bit like Ruth this past year. In a new land with new people, living as a widow in a time when widow was essentially synonymous with vulnerable and worthless and helpless, Ruth could have given up. She could have stuck to what was familiar, 
turned around and gone back to Moab. But see, she didn't abandon everything because she stayed true to her core values, loyalty, love, and ingenuity. The way she acted on those core values changed, but her core values stayed the same. Her grit gave her and Naomi a way out of a tough situation. When I shared Ruth's story with my mom, it reminded her of Dr. Spencer Johnson's book, Who Moved My Cheese? In it, Dr. Johnson tells a story of four characters who, every day, go through a maze looking for their cheese. Two of the characters are humans named Hem and Haw, who overanalyze situations and get too comfortable when they reach their goal. The other two characters are mice named Sniff and Scurry, who focus on the main goal, finding cheese, and prepare to adapt should the need arise. Now, I hope I'm not giving away any spoilers, after all, this book came out when I was two, but at one point in the story, Dr. Johnson writes, One morning, they arrived at Cheese Station C and discovered there was no cheese. They weren't surprised. Since Sniff and Scurry had noticed the supply of cheese had been getting smaller every day, they were prepared for the inevitable and knew instinctively what to do. They looked at each other, removed the running shoes they had tied together and hung conveniently around their necks, put them on their feet and laced them up. The mice did not overanalyze things. To the mice, the problem and the answer were both simple. The situation at Cheese Station C had changed. So, Sniff and Scurry decided to change. We, like Ruth, have been thrust into unfamiliar territory. Navigating life during a global pandemic can feel like running through an ever-changing maze to find our cheese. For better or worse, our teens have changed. The way children receive an education has changed. The way many people work has changed, and some people have even had to change jobs. The way we worship has had to change, as churches all over have had to adapt to ensure people have the chance to worship in safe and sincere ways. Our circumstances have changed. Have we? In Carrie Newhoff's blog post, Why the Current Crisis You're Leading Through Isn't a Marathon, It's the Future, he writes, Wise leaders aren't wagering everything on old methods. Instead, they're focusing on the mission. And as long as there are people, your mission can grow. He uses the phrase, quote, from, myth, from method to mission. And friends, I feel that Ruth did just that saving not only herself and her mother-in-law, but also Jesus' family line. If Ruth had allowed herself to get tied up in methods, she may never have gone to Bethlehem with Naomi. And if she did, she may never have taken the initiative to collect grain, and in so doing, catch Boaz's eye. Who knows what would have happened to her and Naomi? Instead, Ruth doubled down on mission over method, staying true to her core values to help her persevere when her world turned upside down. And that is what we need to do in our lives. Now, those who know me well probably find it hysterical that I'm preaching about personal change management best practices, or as I like to call it, not freaking out when change happens. I love family traditions, and when I find myself in a happy place, I want everything to stay the same forever. I'm not the biggest fan of change. But I need to learn from Ruth, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. It is important to note that just because we need to double down on mission over method does not mean we can no longer miss the good parts of the old ways of doing things. It's just that reminiscing about the past should not forbid us from going into the future with a cheerful heart. My therapist tells me that you can have more than one emotion at once, and this is one of those situations where that's definitely a thing. We cannot acknowledge Ruth's perseverance without also acknowledging another star player in her story. Grief. Grief is a big part of the Book of Ruth. In fact, Naomi, whose name means pleasant, is so deep in grief that when she gets to Bethlehem, she tells people to call her Mara, which means bitter. And as a woman who had to bury her husband and two sons, Facing the reality that she aged out of the Old Testament dating game in a time when she could only get back on her feet through said dating game, I don't blame her. I'm sure we have all experienced grief in some way this past year. 
Personally, I have grieved different losses throughout this pandemic, such as a furlough at work to a lack of in-person family gatherings. How can living out mission over method help us through our grief? The book From Widows to Warriors by Reverend Dr. Lynn Chapinga says, Grief is even more complicated when people feel that God caused their loss, either as punishment for sin or because they believe that God controls everything, including disease and accidents. Is God a divine chess player who controls every bad event in the world? Or do bad things happen in a fallen world and God suffers alongside people in the midst of their grief and loss? Naomi thought she had lost everything, but she had more than she realized. She had Ruth. What we are left with will not replace what we have lost, but it may help with the short-term survival and eventually in the start of healing. Ruth is the image of God in this story. Relationships can be a powerful source of healing and connection and hope. At times, we have the resources to provide steadfast love for others. I just love that section of the book. Persevering when our world turns upside down does not mean we can't grieve the good parts of the way things were. What it means is that in spite of all of our grief, we lean on God's strength and push on. We recognize that we are not experts in the uncharted territory we now have to call home, but we do our best anyway. It means that when the dust settles, we go out and collect grain. As Anna sings in Frozen 2, we do the next right thing. For example, maybe you're like me and miss large, maskless family gatherings with hugs and a buffet full of food. It is 100% okay to grieve the parties you were unable to host this past year. But the party was just the method. The mission was gathering your loved ones together to strengthen relationships and to make memories. So you decide to host a game night on Zoom. Is it the same? No. But does it give you the opportunity to connect with each other? Bridging the gap between pre and post pandemic days? Absolutely. That's how living out mission over method, like Ruth, can help us with our grief. It can give us glimpses of healing through allowing us to live out our purpose in ways that work with our new circumstances. Ruth, like Sniff and Scurry, knew she didn't have time to dwell on who moved her cheese and chose to focus her energy on finding the cheese. Ruth gave Naomi a lifeline, both physically and emotionally. God worked through Ruth to pull them both out of the pit. That is how doubling down on mission over method helps with grief. It strengthens relationships and provides hope when things seem hopeless. What is important to you right now? What is your mission? Have your methods changed? And if they have, what do you cling to? your mission, or your method. As we continue to navigate an ever-changing world, I encourage you to remember these three things we learned from Ruth's story today. One, when your world turns upside down, double down on mission over method. Two, you can persevere and grieve at the same time. Three, follow the snacks even if it leads you to the other side of the kitchen. When I think about perseverance, the first person that comes to mind is definitely my mom. In the last 18 years, she's had to deal with um, a brain tumor, breast cancer, and uterine cancer and more recently tackling the role of being caretaker for my dad. Uh, she has confronted every obstacle that's been thrown in front of her with prayer and grace and determination, with her faith firmly intact underneath her, all while being the best wife, mom, grandmother, sister, aunt, and friend to all the important people in her life. So when I'm facing my own obstacles, I definitely look to my mom for her example of perseverance. Your story is a part of our story, and all stories are a part of God's story.
Today we heard a message of perseverance. It comes from the story of Ruth. One of the ways that we persevere as Christ followers is to remember that we're never alone, that we are part of the body of Christ, and that we are uh, surrounded with Christ's presence through the gift of the Holy Spirit. One of the ways that we do that as a church, month after month, is to celebrate communion together. And virtually, while we're separated and we all don't have access necessarily to, to bread or juice, we have been sharing in something called the Love Feast, a tradition started a couple hundred years ago in England when preachers couldn't be sent to all the places where people called Methodists were. So lay people were empowered to take simple food items, whatever they had, and to lift them up in the same way that we do with communion and to remember, to commemorate Jesus' Last Supper and the love and forgiveness that brings. And it's called Love Feast because it represents God's unconditional love for us. Agape, the Greek word for love, divine love. So today I want to encourage you to get piece of bread, a donut, a cracker. I have a cracker here that I'm going to celebrate with you. And whatever you may have to drink. I have water. You may have coffee or juice or water. But let's just take a moment and center our hearts as we remember God's love for us. God, we give you thanks for joining us across the divide of space and, and even in time as we may Celebrate this at different times. We thank you for your love that perseveres and that can help us to persevere. Oh God, be present among us and bless these elements. Bless these simple gifts of food and of drink that they may be for us. Symbols that represent the body and blood of Christ and may we be united in your spirit as Christ's body, hands and feet in this world. Make us one with you one with each other, and one with all of creation as we join in common ministry to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear friends, we remember that Jesus sat with his disciples and he took bread. He broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he told them to eat and remember that his own body would be broken out of love and grace for them. So today, as we take this bread, or this gift, this food, know that Christ died inclusive of you, loving you, caring for you, and ever present with you. So let us take the body. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, a sign of blessing, he prayed and said, This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, a sign of a new covenant. And so here we take and we remember that as we receive grace, we have been asked to give grace. As God loves us, we love God and we share that love with others. So let us take this cup knowing that we are a forgiven people. Holy God, we give you thanks for the mystery of your agape, your divine love for us. Help us to receive it, for it to descend from our head to our heart, and today into our stomachs and out into our hand and our feet, that we may share your love and your grace, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. We give you thanks. Amen. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow.
friends. May you feel God's presence this week and always as you persevere like Ruth and find your cheese. You love